Hi, this is Megan from Miss Submerge Life. I have had the pleasure to sit down with the lovely Erica and Caroline of The Pithy Chronicle. They are the producers of the podcast, The Pithy Chronicle. I think that the Submerge Life audience will love their historical tales. With a little bit of bite. And a lot of sarcasm. Mm -hmm. We serve it up on a platter. Gold, not silver. Absolutely. We don't just skim the surface. We do deep dives and we get all the dirty, dark details that you're dying to know. Caroline and Erica, tell us a little bit about your business. The Pithy Chronicle is a podcast that is released weekly. The hope is that we entertain with fascinating historical stories and that we will reel you in with the good gossip. We want to prove that history is far more than just dates and treaties. It's crazy people doing crazy things, often for power. We want to highlight the crazy and make you laugh, make you cry, let you know that history continues to repeat itself. And as we see in this world today, people are still doing crazy things. And if you don't learn from history, you'll make the same mistakes, Putin. (laughs) Did I say that out loud? Oops, my bad. Uh Uh-huh. My bad. Whatever. Okay, I see. <laughs> History can be so convoluted. We try really, really hard to make sure we are representing it in a very unbiased way. But don't worry, unbiased does not mean non judgmental. We are really, really putting them to the test. Feet to the flames. Oh, absolutely. But not the witch trials yet. No, that's on the list. <laughs> Is it? It is. Haha. There's a spreadsheet. For those of you who know me, know I love a spreadsheet. There's a spreadsheet. There's a spreadsheet for everything in our business. Love it. And I surely love all of your pithy lessons that you're trying to teach us. (laughs) Erica, what made you choose this type of business? It really wasn't me. So I like to think that it found me by way of Caroline (laughs) because... (laughs) Caroline texted me, I'm super, super pregnant, sick as a dog, and Caroline texted me, hey, want to start a podcast? I did say, I "I hope you're feeling well. Well, I said, (laughs) she did, she did preface. Hey, no time like the present, right? I said, no pressure. She prefaced it. (laughs) But when Caroline asks you to do something, she has thought about it, she has calculated And she has said, hmm, she'll say yes. And she was right. I said yes. Because when Caroline says leap, you leap. And it's been a great jump from there. What are you you shaking your head about? Yeah, it is. It's always a good leap. Don't leap when I say leap. I don't know that that's a great plan. I think it's a great plan. I trust her implicitly with my life. We started kind of back and forthing about what we wanted to do. Both knew that we loved history because we did some trivia nights while we were in Yokosuka. Which and is part we of our were... plan for the Pithy Chronicle is to have yes. history trivia nights that we're going to use as we go down the road with prizes and things like that. But they're going to be hard. They're not going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. So what you're saying is the nukes will absolutely 100%. love it, right? Yes. This is for the nukes out there. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> What motivated you to start your business? Oh, that's a Caroline one. So COVID hit, super unfun. And I had an infant and a toddler. My husband was deployed and I'm a runner. And I was like, I'm going to take my runs. They're going to be my time. And I am a weird person and like to listen to history podcasts while I run because (laughs) obviously that's inspiring. Weird. It's very weird. I know, I know. Calm down. As I cue up my gangster rap playlist. That's what I do. (laughs) Give me little Wayne. (laughs) All right, y'all. I have a whole... Well, I don't do gangster rap, I will say. Like, it's just not in my... My husband makes fun of my lack of popular music knowledge. But no, I I do listen to music sometimes. But often, if I'm going on like a 10-mile run, I really prefer a narrative to keep me through. These are not... For time runs, these are just for distance and to let out steam. But I found that the history podcasts, and this will surprise you, were a little slow paced. Are you for the run? I can't imagine. (laughs) Right? And I had a couple that I really liked, but I found that they often were either too dry or too giggly. It it was there was no combination. Either they just couldn't focus on what was happening, or they had no levity in them and you just couldn't sustain. 
And so I thought about it for a year. Why is there no one making a podcast? Kind of like Gilmore Girls meets a history lesson. And I just couldn't figure out why no one was doing this. So I texted Erica one day on a whim. And I thought, she's pregnant. She'll say no. And said, I hope you're feeling well. Let's do I think it was nicer than that. Pretty sure. Well, and Zach had to do some school in San Diego. She's in San Diego. So we had gotten together and she did not mention this to me not once while we were there. Now she said, I think I'm going to write a children's book. And I was like, you know what? If, if anyone can do it, it's Caroline. Go at it. Good job. It was like a throwaway comment. I didn't think, oh, she's scheming. But she was scheming. I was scheming. And my scheme was I have two young kids. We are going to move all the time. That is part of a spouse's life within this military system. And I thought, I want a job. I am not destined to be a stay-at-home mom. But I want a job that I don't have to get a new one every 18 months. And Mm -hmm. I used to be an opera singer. Opera is out these days with two little kids running underfoot. I just can't be out until 11 p.m., 12 p.m. every night on the stage. That's not going to work for us. So I was trying to think of something that would challenge me and motivate me and keep me from killing my own children, but at the same time was movable. And so I had been scheming for about six months. What is the thing that I can try to sink my teeth in and make work for my situation so that I don't go crazy? And then she started a podcast and has continued to go crazy. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I love it, but I call it channeling your energy, right? Much better. Channeling your energy. I do Because if you put all of that into your home life, when your spouse leaves, it upends everything. So if you have something outside of your home life that's constant, I just think it's healthier. Absolutely. I just think it's important for my state of being. Personally, my mental health, I feel the same way. I agree with that too. I'm sure many parents out there know whenever you have a kid, sometimes it just mushes, goes out the window. The mom brain is real. Mm -hmm. So I needed something to keep my brain fresh. That's another reason why I was so excited to start this was to keep that that side of my brain working. Yes. The intellectual stimulation. Erica and I are actually coming out with a children's series. We're going to premiere it on July 4th. Oh, I love it. It's called Once Upon a History, and they're five to ten minute fairy tales, but they are true stories of historical figures that are told for the children's eye. Oh, yeah, I love that idea. These will be not a podcast, but rather just something that you can get on iTunes. My kids listen to stories in the car a lot, but... I mm-hmm. just finished writing the one about Sacagawea, and I'd much rather them listen to Sacagawea than Cinderella. Or Coco Melon. Oh my god, right. Let's let's go with reality versus... Bluey. I have not gotten behind Bluey, and I have a very good reason. It's because they're only eight minutes long, and then they have a four-minute stretch of credits, which loses all of my children's attention, and then there they go. So I only get eight minutes of peace, and it's just not enough for me. <laughs> I have an issue. Why has this not been fixed? <laughs> I can't be the only one. (laughs) How do you two manage work-life balance as a military spouse? Oh, last night my husband told me that I had been, quote, distant and that I was working on a Sunday night when he thought we were supposed to be Netflixing and chilling. And (laughs) I was informed that if I was going to be doing this, I needed to give him a heads up so he had something with which to entertain himself. (laughs) <laughs> wink, wink. And my response was like, okay, well, those 10 months you were just gone. Welcome to I my I guess life. you should have given me something to entertain myself with. <laughs> Good for you. By the way, working meant that I'm sitting in the living room with him with a computer in my lap, typing up and notes. Still Netflixing chilling. And still Netflixing and chilling. All the chilling occurred, so I don't have a great answer. Did all of the chilling occur? Okay, stop it. <laughs> wait, wait. Stop it. So spicy. It doesn't but- sound like anything spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I think me having something that gives me purpose and challenges me mm-hmm. helps with the work-life balance because otherwise your life revolves around your spouse's work. And that is stressful because you have zero control over it and it's unfulfilling. 
I would rather have a little bit of extra stress in my life. Like right now, I'm literally texting him, you're going to get the kids, right? Because school ends in 30 minutes and I'm on the phone and we discussed that this was going to be happening. I'd rather have that than not have something my own and gives me purpose. Yeah. But my laptop lives on the counter and whenever I have something, I run over and start doing it. Absolutely. You never know when the creativity is going to hit. Oh, that's so true. You don't. You just have to go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think my biggest trick for everything in my life is expectation management. So if I'm sitting down to do something, I try to have a little short 30 second conversation with myself. What are my expectations here? So that way. So what you're saying is I should have told Alex the expectation you should have for the evening is I'm going to be typing as we watch this TV show. (laughs) (laughs) So then we do. Oh, I do that with my husband all the time. I'll try it next Uh, time. All the time. I do that because I want him to tell me because I can't read his mind. Help me read your mind, friend. Tell me what you want, which is hard for me because I want him to just innately know. Like, shouldn't you just know that I want a foot rub? Duh. Like, I like the idea of setting expectations, Erica. That's good. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So Jenna Bush Hager wrote a book. She mentions this question. She says... When people ask me how I have a work-life balance, I don't. And I think it's a very privileged thing to have a work-life balance, right? Because no one would ask the single mom making $10 an hour how she manages a work-life balance. So that sort of changed my mindset about it. They also don't ask your husband. No one asks the military spouse that either. I would say that if you were to interview the military member, they would be like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. I do my job and I have my family and I make it work because what else would I do? I think Zach's answer would be, I come home for bath time. <laughs> Done. I, I, you laugh, but that like that's the goal to get home before bath and bed. I get that. I am very lucky to have a spouse who is a co-parent and a partner. However, that that is during shore Mm -hmm. tour. During sea tour, I take the little tiny lowest thing that I could possibly get because I just know that I can never depend on him to do daycare pickup. Nothing. Expectation management. Absolutely. If you expect little, you're not disappointed, right? As terrible as that sounds. (laughs) Well, it's true. (laughs) It does sound terrible. Like saying this right here, putting this out for the world to know, we don't Mm -hmm. expect our spouses when they're at sea to be helpful in our parenting style in any way, shape, or form. Sounds terrible. But it's not their priorities are different. It's that the requirements are different. I think at least for me, I support this lifestyle. We talked about it as a couple before we took the plunge, Mm -hmm. took the blood money and ran with it. We discussed it. And so I think that you have to understand that it's a partnership that entered this and it's a partnership that will leave. And how you get there in between, there will be different levels of heavy lifting. That's any marriage. I mean, if you think or any, you know, any profession, I guess, because I feel like we get bemoaned a lot and Mm -hmm. people get out because they're like, oh, it's just so miserable. Well, every job is miserable. It all has miserable. Not ours, Erica. What are you talking about? That's right. That's right. Not ours. Not ours. It's pure joy. What advice would you give a fellow military spouse who wanted to start their own business? Expectation management. (laughs) (laughs) That and time management, being able to carve out time to do it. Because we do so much for our spouse, our kids, our dogs, our community. It is okay. And sometimes you need somebody to give you the blessing and say, it's okay to have time to yourself. However you want to break it up, making sure you have that dedicated time for you to do your project or your business. Even if it's slow, building it, you will come out better and more refreshed and able to give back all of those wonderful things that you already give to your community and give it from a full cup rather than an empty cup. I love the old proverb, you can't pour from an empty cup. I mean, I maybe abuse it a little bit because I'm like, you know, I can't pour from an empty cup. I need a manicure. But it is, at the essence, very true. I have not yet pulled that one out of a hat, and I might need you, to. That's it. I like that. You can't pour from the to go. I like it. I think that Erica's memoir should be titled 
expectation management. Yeah, I will say that in light of the expectation management, when starting a business, expect it will take a lot more effort than you think. Mm-hmm. Expect there will be more bumps in the road and you should expect that something you think will be simple like editing a podcast will take you two full days. Yeah. It's gotten faster. But yeah, starting anything new, if you if you're going to do it and I am a full believer in giving 100% in anything you do, I don't think that if you half ass something, you get the results that you want. If you do that, it's going to take more time than you expect. I thought this would be part-time. It is now beyond full-time. It will not always be that way, I don't think, but right now just trying to get it up on its feet. It's tiring. It's worth it, but it's more work than you think Uh, expect the unexpected (laughs) and incorporating life is difficult too because you know caroline's got a wedding coming up i went back to the states and my microphone wouldn't work in virginia for some reason it's like the house was possessed working around these has been a big part of it but just because it's unexpected doesn't mean it's not rewarding pull a tim gun make it work make it work How do you intertwine the military life in your podcast? What aspects of the military lifestyle or any historical military events, how how do you put that in your podcast? Well, as our listeners may know, there is a lot of military within our podcast in history because you have to win wars somehow. So we do get into a couple of the nitty gritty, (laughs) you do have to win wars somehow. You have to win wars somehow. It's, It's so true. But also, we do try to highlight some mill spouses. We've got Sybil Stocktail coming up, which she's pretty prolific, but she gets overshadowed, obviously, by her husband. And so we're excited to highlight her accomplishments and the fact that she, with a team of other mill spouses, got him out of a war camp. So I think that's pretty significant and shouldn't be overlooked. The government pretty much said that they didn't have a way to get these men home after the war. And she was like, ladies, spouses, do we want to have them come home? Let's do something about it. Exactly. And she just spearheaded this entire campaign and said, we will be getting our spouses back. You will be doing this. And we will make a huge PR fuss if you do not take your responsibility seriously. She held the government accountable and made sure that Mm -hmm. the right thing was done. So we do like to show military spouses in the best light. And as we've talked about just in our our day-to-day lives, there are women and men that are constantly living their lives based on their spouse, who they themselves are doing miraculous and amazing things. Mm -hmm. We also just bring it into the conversation. You know, we don't make a huge deal out of it, but at the same time, we do discuss that our lives are a little bit unique in the fact that we are mill spouses and that we have Mm -hmm. just different obstacles that we have to overcome because of that. And our husbands both put in a number of military suggestions for the podcast episodes Some of which we have shot down, Mm -hmm. but some of which we have actually put in. Like we're doing an episode in May about the Batavia shipwreck, which it's like a shipwreck and a cult and a murderous rampage. Murder story. It's crazy. And that was actually on the suggestion of my father, who is also military. So we do definitely try to put them in there when we can. I really love that. And I love the fact that you said you like to highlight the positive things, these amazing stories of military spouses, because so often in the history books, they are overshadowed. During the pandemic, I stepped away from nursing because my husband was gone all the time. I was scared I was going to get COVID. So I was working the bare minimum because I had a toddler at home, no childcare, Let's not relive that. But we all know and feel for you. It was it was a tough time. Yeah. So I took a deep dive. I just started reading all the books on my husband's Kindle. All these just snooze worthy books. Snooze worthy. But one book I read was The Admirals. And we have that book upstairs. All I kept thinking was I would love to know who their spouses were, the people that were at home holding down the home front during these tumultuous times, because I'm sure y'all feel the same way as me. My spouse definitely brings the best out in me and makes me want to be a better person. And I think that happens most of the time in marriages. So I I was always curious. I wonder what these spouses were like. So I love that, that, that you're taking the time to 
to create a story, to create a podcast, to tell Sybil's story. I I was really excited about it. It was something that Erica found and really wanted to present, and I thought it was great. I have found a number of military spouse histories, and I, as the podcast will tell you, I really like the spicier, deadlier side of history. Like, I just, I just enjoy the drama. I am definitely dramatic. And so... You are who you are, and there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, Erica. So I have actually... Well, I think that comes from being a performance artist. I mean, you're an opera singer. It is very easy to see that we do tend towards that. But I have found a number of perhaps less desirable spouses throughout history. Like there was um, a prostitution ring going on in the housing um, on base. When was this? In the 60s. In the 60s. There was like a brothel on base. But, so we, we're not going to necessarily promote that, but there's history everywhere you want to find it. If you're interested in something, mm-hmm. there's something exciting that happened. You just have to look. I love that. History anywhere you want to find it. That's that's a good one. I love it. I, I love that. We've highlighted that we live so much of our lives for other people. And, and it is a pleasure to do that. I love having my kid. I love my husband. I love this life. But it is nice to come back to the podcast and to history and be able to look at those things and then present them. Like Caroline said, they're doing miraculous and amazing things. And being able to do that without bias is really nice. Erica, what is your favorite podcast you've recorded thus far? Ooh. <laughs> Uh oh. Um, I really enjoyed Heloise and Avalard. It was part of our first history sampler. Our push. But I just got so heated, so heated about it because Peter Avalard is the worst. The misogyny really gets her. I c- I could tell. I could tell. She literally changes boxes. color. Yeah. yeah, we do like our soapboxes. Just the fact that he has <laughs> the call and the audacity to write down. The things that he thinks about himself. To write down. That's honestly the best part. It's not that he has these misogynistic sexual views. (laughs) It's that he puts it to paper and then saves it for all eternity. Like, (laughs) keep that in the box. I'm not even surprised or shocked by the misogyny. It's the fact that he's like, I am a good looking man. That's the equivalent of the selfie today. Anyone that takes a selfie and then posts it to Facebook is pulling an Abelard. Okay. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? I don't think so. (laughs) No, let's elevate it. The modern day Abelard is the shirtless man on Tinder taking a selfie. Yes. Yes. Uh, Honestly, I could see Abelard just doing the (laughs) full on dick pic. Let's be real. Oh, yes. Okay. He would include his face as well because it's lovely according to his own. The full Monty? Oh my. It would be a full Monty. Why would he be ashamed? It's natural. Yeah, why would he be ashamed of, you know? And as a nurse practitioner, all I can think of is the syphilis. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. But apparently he was only ever with Heloise. Oh. He came up with this whole plan to woo her, getting ensconced in the house, getting a job literally around wooing this woman, and he hadn't had sex before? No. No. I did not realize that. I did not make that connection. Afterwards, yes. Well, obviously. Now, in the text, he says, I've never spent myself on any woman because of his relationship with the church and as an academic. But this woman, she's not very pretty, but she's bright, so she'll do. What every woman wants to hear. Mm -hmm. She'll do. (laughs) She'll do. (laughs) Where do y'all see your podcast in the next 12 months? What vision, what mission, what you see on the horizon? We would love to have a pretty steady listenership. And we would really like to continue to build our fan base and our listeners to then have trivia nights, as I said, to really promote this love of history. We would love to have listeners writing in about what they want to hear. When you wrote me, you said, I'm interested in military spouse history. And we went out and found something and we're really excited to present that. So we'd really like it to be a partnership with the listeners where they get to learn about the things that fascinate them. And in return, we assume, and I'm sure it will be so, that we will learn about things we've never heard of based on their suggestions. And we'd really like it to be a sustainable business, something that allows us to have some financial independence, but still get to do something we love that we can take with us 
And as we talked about, we're doing this children's spinoff, Once Upon a History. So we're trying to build different facets of it to try to bulk it up and make it a real presence to promote history as fun as entertaining and as worth putting the time into. I tell people that I have a history podcast and they're like, oh yeah, I didn't really like history. And I just think, what history were you in? Anyone out there that has that feeling, I will make a believer out of you. Just give me an episode or two. Yeah, their eyes glaze over. Yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge too. You don't think this is interesting or funny or shocking? Let me show you. I think as far as in the year, I, I would love to grow our Patreon so we can really lean into all those exciting extras that we want to put forward because we really want to do the tea time and rabbit holes. We want to start those trivia nights and we do have extra resources and information that are on the Patreon already for those who are following, like a little series called Knowledge Nuggets. There are like infographics that we put up with our episodes. I think mostly we just want to have that partnership and that camaraderie among our listeners where we have and are building relationships and and learning. Caroline and I have done enough school (laughs) to realize that we both really enjoy being educated and, and just continually building on that. Also, just a side note, if you are having to do a crazy dinner party or you don't have something to talk about, You can always be like, well, listen to what I know. So now you have some more obscure things. Talking points beyond the weather. Right. It's not, oh, the sky was blue today. And not to mention trivia nights. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's true. We both are huge fans of trivia nights. My husband and I, before we had children, would go to trivia on the regular. We came to win. Let's just state this from the beginning. Like, we didn't come to just, like, hang out. We had a plan. Everyone's shocked. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right? Everyone is like, what? And so we've missed that with kids. It's just not worth getting a babysitter at 9 p.m. to go to a trivia night. And so Erica and I are really hoping to get to recreate this with our Patreons and have quarterly or maybe even monthly trivia nights Mm -hmm. uh, that are all online based and where they're interactive with real prizes. Love it. I can't wait to hear the name. I can't can't Yeah, we haven't put a name yet. It will have to be alliterative. Or punny. Oh, for sure, punny. For sure, punny. Okay, so you have to say the first thing that comes to mind. Caroline, what is your favorite thing about San Diego, your current duty station? The weather. Oh, gosh. I grew up with all four seasons, and so it's an unusual thing for me to just live in like a perpetual late spring all the time. I just love it so much. I've just thrown away all my winter clothes. No, it's not true. I kept them because I know we're going to move. I've enjoyed being outside. I like to run outside. I've really enjoyed all the outdoor things. Like we go to the zoo all the time. We're at the pool. And that's not something that we've been able to do in any of our other duty stations. So that feels quite special in this environment. Erica, you are coming to us from Japan. What is your favorite thing about your current duty station? Without a doubt, the food. I'm a lover of food in general, but the best thing for me about Japan and Japanese cuisine is you can get it quickly and pretty cheaply. My husband and I went on a romantic anniversary dinner and we went to a Michelin star restaurant and we were pretty ready to put out some money, but for two people, it was still under $100, which for a Michelin star restaurant is pretty darn good. Wow. That you can actually get a reservation to. That's true. Fun little nugget. Tokyo has more Michelin star rated restaurants than I think almost any other country. So it's a good food scene. It is a good food scene. It is a good food scene. I do miss the food. Caroline, if you could live in any duty station, what is your number one? A friend of mine did a NATO tour in Paris. So that would be up there. But I think you mean just one of the general options. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would really like to go to Stuttgart next. We've talked about that a lot. I speak a little German from my opera time, and I lived in Europe quite a bit when I was in my early 20s, and so I would like to go back. Yeah, Europe would be my preference. Erica, what's your number one? I'm living in my number one, but if it was somewhere I had never been before, also one of our friends did a joint tour over in Brussels, and so I would love to do that. Again, I also speak a little bit of German. 
So as I've told y'all when I reached out, I absolutely love listening to your podcast and I would love for the Submerge Life audience to be able to access your podcast. What is the best way that we can support and learn more about your podcast? Well, you are in luck. Anywhere you find your podcasts, you'll find us. Apple, Spotify, Google Play. We're there. You can listen on our website, thepiffychronicle.com. There's a whole resource section so you can look at our show notes, which has basically all of our bibliographies and any media we've used. But we try to be as accessible as possible because we want to have a wide viewership. We want that diversity because it promotes, like we said earlier, that, that growth and learning. And the partnership. We're also on Instagram and Facebook as The Pithy Chronicle, and we have had quite a bit of feedback and always like it, and we always respond really quickly. Mm -hmm. If you're a first-time listener or you're just learning about us now and you're like, I haven't even listened yet, but I really want to know about this subject, all you have to do is slide into the DM, and we'll try to accommodate that. Yeah, slide into our DMs. That's the whole point. Y'all heard them. Just slide just directly slide into the DMs. slide on in. Wait, no. Mm. No, no. Every time, every time I sound dirtier than anticipated. <laughs> la, 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 la. Here I am talking about Netflix and Chile. I'm failing. Yeah, yeah, because I definitely uh, did not. I know, like, it's always me. And then I choose the unvirginal Venetian nuns. You know, I just, I can't win. Yeah, and I'm such a blusher when it comes to the scandalous. So I always make Caroline read it. And I'm happy to oblige. <laughs> Separation from your spouse will do this to you, right? Mm -hmm. It will. That's right. I am an avid romance novel connoisseur. I usually have one nonfiction and one romance and one mystery going at one time. Same. And it has to be some terrible 99 cent Amazon deal romance novel. Yes, I it can just can't be good. No. I just eat them up. I, I just... <laughs> I was telling Caroline about this. The worse the writing is, the better. She corrects the grammar in the books that she reads. I mean, listen... I love it because not only am I getting the good, bad content, I'm also getting to feed my academic soul. You do you. Fixed things are nice. Yeah. <laughs> This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank y'all so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you. We are so excited to be a part. You reached out and we were honored that you'd listened. We're so excited that you enjoy the puns. I love them. Thank you. Love Erica it. Erica thinks they're lame. I but think you they're, know they're silly. Amazing. It's like dad jokes, but mom jokes. Mom jokes. But I'm here for them. I really love the podcast. I can't wait to hear. I, which one did I just listen to? Oh, no, The Venetian Virgins. That's that's the one I just finished. That's a yeah. good one. Lots of pith in that one. But I can't decide which is my favorite. I think The Mummies. Yes. Thank you. I love The I Mummies. I loved The Mummies. The Mummies. I think mummies are fascinating. If I was extremely wealthy, I would go on an archaeological dig. That, that would be my ultimate. You don't actually have to be wealthy to do it. <laughs> They're always looking. But when I say go on an archaeological dig, I mean like I want to glamp. I want to do it glamorously, not... Um... In style where you have your own houseboat <laughs> yes. on the Nile. Yes, yes. Your maidservant would bring you your cocktail while you watched the poor sweating men digging and you were like, oh, that looks important. Bring it to me. Yes, that's how I would do it too. <laughs> Love it. We'll keep in touch and maybe one day we'll connect IRL. Wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> IRL. Yeah. I would uh, love that. Megan, thank you so much. It was so nice to officially meet Take you. Take care. Thank y'all. You do as well. Please stay tuned for a short preview of our episode on Sybil Stockdale, the OG Bond girl, the wife of James Bond Stockdale, and most importantly, her husband's truest and most outspoken advocate who ensured that he, along with 600 other prisoners, returned safely after being held captive during the Vietnam War. A Navy officer's wife, trained not to rock the boat. Then her husband, a fighter pilot, was shot down over North Vietnam in September 1965. The boat got rocked. Quote, Soon after hearing the news of Jem's disappearance, the phone started to ring with official Navy messages and friends offering sympathy and support. 
I still felt only a numb, sleepwalking sensation. I felt somewhat reassured by remembering that in the briefing about guidelines, if your husband was taken prisoner, the commander had said our government believed the men being held were well treated. If I kept quiet, the Navy felt the communists would continue to treat the men in a humane and civilized way. I felt sure the government had a good reason to insist on this keep quiet policy. So obviously, our girl does not take the sitting down. She decides that she must act. I'm guessing that the military, knowing this was such an unpopular war, didn't want it highly publicized, that men were not only dying, but were being taken prisoner and then not being treated well at all. And from what I saw when I was in Vietnam of how those prisoners were treated, it was it was gut-wrenching to think about. And I think that the intelligent and outspoken Sybil Stockdale, who redubbed it the keep quiet policy from quiet diplomacy, was perhaps just being like, let's call a spade a spade. F you people, get my husband home. On October 27th, 1968, she defied the government's policy. This is like six months after her husband is taken. Good for you. Don't wait on them. Mm -mm. She went public with her husband's story in the San Diego Union Tribune not acting alone, an informal network of POW wives, parents, siblings were taking matters into their own hands to demand North Vietnamese compliance with the terms of the Geneva Convention. Yes. Chills. Yes. Chills. These women are kicking ass and taking names. They are not letting this stand. And it is so impressive. Yeah. Humanity is at stake in some ways. This notion of holding a government accountable to its people that it has sent overseas to fight for them and saying, you must take care of them. Exactly. Chills. But what I find so sensational about this is that it wasn't that many people, but they made themselves strong by uniting and making sure that they could not be ignored. And it is exactly how male spouses work today. It is a huge network that is usually supportive. (laughs) Most of us are highly educated and willing to make something out of, frankly, less than nothing. But on the darker side, we often get overlooked. We are cast as dependents as spouses, which means that we are dependent upon our military member for our health care and their salary. But the problem is, I'm not dependent on my husband. I'm an independent woman, I think. So having this word of dependent is already derogatory. I would agree. And it is lessening what a military spouse brings to a marriage or a partnership. And I think that that is something the military still views very differently from the modern interpretation of marriage. My grandmother used to say that if the military wanted you to have a spouse, they would issue it with your sea bag. And I think that is very true. It is much easier if you don't have a spouse. (laughs) But military spouses, when their backs are up against a wall, they know how to get things done. And clearly in this case can come running and get something fixed, established, created. We can even guilt the government into foreign policy changes. (laughs) Hot diggity damn. (laughs) Hot diggity damn. I've never said that combination of words and I'm loving it. You should say it every day. In Sybil's own words, quote, I, along with several other wives of POWs, was invited to attend a meeting in Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird's office in Washington, D.C. As I sat there in the Secretary's handsomely decorated, spacious dining room, I felt we were beginning to make some progress. This was the first time I'd heard any talk about specific plans for the end of the war. I thought it was a pretty weak plan myself. (laughs) Of course she did. did. She's like, I could fix this, but whatever. But I couldn't help liking Secretary Laird. He'd ended the keep quiet policy and had the guts to talk about the truth of the prisoner's treatment in public. Sybil Stockdale is the recipient of the Navy Distinguished Public Service Award, the highest award given by the Department of the Navy to a citizen not employed by the department. She is the only wife of an active duty officer to ever have been so honored. You know, this woman, she doesn't hold a punch. And I love that about her. Thank you, Erica, for finding something that was so close to home for us personally, and that also resonates as such a wonderful, happy ending for our listeners that are non-military, because I'm sure they needed a breather. (laughs) And I'm happy to tell you, Sybil and her husband continued to advocate for MIA POWs for the rest of their lives. With that, I'm Erica. And I'm Caroline. And we are Pithily Yours.
This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!